Story recapped here. Today, I'm going to explain a crime, drama, and mystery film called, The Clove Hitch Killer. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. In a small remote town in Clarksville, Kentucky, a neighborhood is haunted by a string of murders that happened years ago. The killer called himself the Clove Hitch Killer, after his favorite type of knot. Even though he stopped killing over 10 years ago, the town still lives in fear and holds an annual memorial, headed by their community pastor, Pastor Randy, for the victim's families and friends. In this town leaves 16-year-old Tyler Burnside with his devoutly Christian family. His dad, Don, a handyman and troop leader of the Clarksville Rangers, which Tyler is also a member of. His mother, Cindy, and his little sister, Susie. He also has Uncle Rudy, his father's brother who lives in an elderly care facility and whom the family is caring for. They are loved and known by everyone in town and are considered to be much-loved members of the community. After a morning meeting with the scouts, Don tells Tyler that work has been slow and Uncle Rudy's insurance increased so Tyler won't be able to join the leadership camp as planned to help with his college applications. Despite feeling disappointed, Tyler knows they have to put family first. Later that night, Tyler sneaks into his parents' bedroom and steals the keys to his dad's truck. He meets up with Amy, a girl he goes to church with that he likes, and they start making out in an empty parking lot. As they make out, Amy finds a picture of a naked woman in bondage near the passenger seat. Tyler denies that the picture is his but Amy is quickly weirded out by the situation and tells him to take her home. The next morning, the family picks up Uncle Rudy and they attend church together. During the praise and worship, Tyler can't help but feel like he's getting weird looks, especially from Amy. After the service, Billy, one of his churchmates and also a scout member, approaches him and talks about the girl lurking in the parking lot. He feels creeped out by her and tells him that she does the same report on the Clove Hitch killings every year. Tyler accuses him of having a crush on her, but Billy responds with disgust saying that the girl allegedly did it with five football players because her mom left the family to become a stripper. Their conversation is cut short by Tyler's mom who tells him that they have to go. As they leave, he gets the same weird look from the girls again. At home, Tyler receives a text from Billy and learns that Amy has told the whole school about the photo. Later that day, the family attends the annual memorial for the Clove Hitch victims headed by Pastor Randy. After the service, Tyler confronts Amy about the photo and tells her that it isn't his. Amy tells him that she only told one person and didn't intend for the whole school to know. As Amy leaves, the girl from the church named Cassie approaches him. Tyler confronts her for being a weirdo but she retorts back about the photo, prompting him to leave. When his parents leave for the day, Tyler goes to his father's shed, feeling curious about the photos. He searches through his father's things and finds nothing, but at the last minute, he spots a loose board on the floor. He opens it up and finds a dusty old box. Inside the box were countless bondage magazines and a single Polaroid photo of a woman tied up and gagged. On the photo, written in pen, was a caption that says, Nora, Lucky's favorite. The Polaroid disturbs Tyler to the core and he stashes it back into the box. Don gets back from the community center and goes to his shed, only to find that the lock has been touched. Later that night, Tyler lays in bed awake, thinking about the disturbing picture he's found in his father's possession. Unable to sleep, he goes to the living room and looks up the name he found on the Polaroid. It turns out that Nora Devlin was one of the Clove Hitch killer's victims. A light turns on and his mother interrupts his research and sends him back to bed. The next morning, his mother sends him to his father to have the talk, thinking that her son has been up all night searching for restricted photos. At the shed, Don tells Tyler that he knows that he took his truck last night. He then tells his son that he understands the conflicting feelings between being a devoted Christian and being a teenager undergoing puberty. He reassures him that it's normal to have these thoughts as long as you don't act on them. Tyler leaves the awkward talk, feeling more confused than before about his father. Trying to clear up his name, Tyler heads over to Billy and tells him that the photo isn't his. Billy doesn't listen to him and tells him he should start praying for his sins. Desperate for help, Tyler goes back to the church and sees Cassie again, and follows her into the woods. He asks her for her help in investigating the Clove Hitch killings. Cassie is hesitant at first but she eventually tells him to meet up with her at 3 at her given address and to bring cookies. Tyler rides his bike the next day to the address Cassie gave her. He gives the cookies to her grandmother who answers the door and heads up to Cassie's room. She gives him a box full of copies of evidence from a case and a book that talked about the killings. It turns out that her grandmother used to work on the case and wrote a book about it. She tells him that every serial killer has a signature style like a fingerprint, including the Clove Hitch killer. The killer had the same entry points, the same elaborate ropes on the bodies, and a clove hitch knot tied to every victim's house. 
Cassie doesn't believe that the killer has stopped and she's working to catch him on his weakness. In the evening during family time, Tyler lies to his family and tells them that he'll be spending his afternoons volunteering as a tutor, but in truth, he'll be working with Cassie on investigating the clove hitch killings. Tyler spends the next afternoon sifting through evidence with Cassie in her room. Unbeknownst to him, Don has followed his son and is watching his every move. When Tyler gets back home, Don tells him that he knows he hasn't been tutoring but sneaking out to meet his girlfriend. He then tells him that he shouldn't lie to his mother and instead invite the girl tomorrow for dinner. The next day, Tyler invites Cassie over for dinner and asks her to pretend to be his girlfriend and not mention any of the investigations they're doing. Later that night, Cassie joins the Burnsides for dinner. After an awkward start, Cassie hits it off immediately with Tyler's parents. On the way home, Cassie jokingly asks Tyler if he thinks his dad is the Clovenich killer. He looks horrified at the question and tells her about the magazines, the shed, and the Polaroid. She reassures him that it's normal for adults to have kinks and there's no way that his dad could be the killer. When Tyler gets home, he joins his family in washing the dishes. He feels a deep pit in his stomach as he looks at his seemingly normal family. Despite Cassie's reassurances, he remains disturbed at what he has just unearthed. At midnight, he hears knocking coming from his window. It's Cassie. She's come to tell him that the fifth victim received a note a week before she was murdered. He takes her to the shed and opens the loose floorboard, but the box is already gone. She reaches her hand inside and takes out a piece of paper. The two teenagers look shocked as they unfold a blueprint for what looked like a dungeon of horrors. Cassie takes a picture and leaves while Tyler goes to one of their vents. His brain is trying to convince him that this is all a big misunderstanding but his gut is telling him otherwise. He goes into the crawl space and finds a false wooden cover. He pushes the cover away and squeezes himself into a small makeshift den. As he turns on the light, he sees a small room with an incomplete toilet and shower. On the side is a box full of bondage magazines, grotesque sketches, and a small tin container. Tyler opens the container slowly and takes out a bunch of driver's licenses tied together. With trembling hands, he sifts through the licenses and sees Nora Devlin. The worst has been confirmed. His father, Don, is the clove hitch killer. When morning comes, Tyler lays awake on his bed. His father comes in and insists that they go camping today. Tyler is reluctant to go, confused about his feelings for his father, but he eventually agrees. In the woods, they bring their rifles, hoping to practice for Tyler's rifle merit badge. As they take a break, Don cleans out his rifle and asks Tyler if he has told anyone. Tyler tries to deny it at first but he confronts him and lets him know that he's aware that Tyler has been to his shed and his crawl space. He calls him out for his son's lack of privacy and tells him that what he found in the box wasn't his. Don tells his son that the box belonged to his uncle Rudy. When they were younger, both of them, Don and Rudy, had an interest in these kinds of photos. When they got older, Don stopped but Rudy got worse to the point where they had to ask him to turn himself in. That's when his uncle Rudy tried to kill himself by crashing his car. Tyler is shocked to learn this as he was initially told that his uncle got into a car crash resulting in his condition. He asks his father why he has kept the photos all this time. Don defends himself and tells him that he had intended to burn it or turn it into the police, but there was never a right time. Eventually, he just stopped trying in order to save his family from hurt and scandal. Don then apologizes to his son. Tyler tells his father that he either has to turn in the evidence or destroy it once and for all. When they get home, Don brings out all the magazines, photos, and even the licenses, and burns them all. Tyler watches, thinking to himself if this is really the right thing to do. The next day, Tyler attends a class tying knots with his father who continues to pretend as if nothing has happened. Tyler goes out of class to talk to Cassie who's angry at him for ditching him. She's finally figured out that the blueprint was for the Burnside's house and she's actually gone into their crawl space. He insists that it's not him and that his father has explained everything. Cassie doesn't believe him and takes out the files from the case. Tyler makes her drop the files and then helps her pick up the papers. Billy goes out into the hallway and calls out Cassie for being deranged. Billy curses him and Tyler immediately lunges at him on her defense. A fight erupts and Tyler is sent to Pastor Randy who reprimands him for his behavior. When Tyler gets home, he receives an apology note from Cassie on his window. The next day, Tyler boards the bus for his leadership program. His father managed to find a way to fund his retreat. Tyler bids his family goodbye and climbs up the bus with an uneasy heart. Meanwhile, with his son away, Don suggests to his wife that she and Susie should go visit her grandmother. Cindy agrees to take a week or two off and sets up the plan with her husband. Later that night, the couple makes love but their moment is cut short when Don starts feeling unwell. 
He reassures his wife that it's nothing serious and he's just getting old and they share an intimate embrace. When morning comes, Don bids Cindy and Susie goodbye. He is finally alone. Now, he can go and set out what he really intended to do. He goes about his work, hangs out with the locals, and goes shopping. At the grocery, he meets a nice woman at the frozen section. He keeps an eye on her at the counter and stalks her all the way to her home. When he gets home, he goes up to the attic to take out his old equipment, even his old Polaroid camera. He sets up the camera in the living room and dresses as a woman in bondage with a mask and wig on his head. He listens to music as he takes several pictures of himself. He goes back into the bedroom and looks at the dresses laid on the bed. Suddenly, the doorbell rings. Don changes his clothes and meets Cassie in the hallway. She's looking for Tyler and he tells her that he's away on his leadership retreat. He then takes the camera and asks her if she wants a picture. After he takes her picture, Cassie's phone rings. It's her father. She excuses herself and bids him goodbye. When Cassie leaves, Don inspects the photos he's taken and slams them on the bed. He throws a tantrum on the bed and screams in frustration. He was supposed to savor these killings and enjoy them, but now he couldn't. Everything is spiraling out of control and he hates being out of control. Something must be done with his son, but now is not the time to think about it. When he comes back from his program, he will deal with him then, but this time is for him only. He regains his composure and drives to the woman's house. In her backyard, he inspects the vent going into her basement and ties a clove hitch knot onto one of her pipes. Later on, Don attends church service with his brother and meets up with the scouts. When he gets home, he lays out all the equipment he needs for his killing and calls his wife to check up on her. The woman lays on her living room couch, unaware of the horror that's about to happen to her. Don breaks in through the open basement window and quietly makes his way up to the living room. He hovers over the sleeping woman, savoring the moments before he makes his kill, and then turns off the television. The woman wakes up and he immediately points a gun at her neck and threatens to shoot her if she screams. He tells the woman that he just robbed a bank and he needs the keys to her car. He grabs her purse and takes out her keys and driver's license. The woman is trembling in terror as she examines the man who's about to end her life. Don takes a picture of her and adds it to his collection. He threatens her by saying that if she tells the cops, he has her picture and he'll send out his friends for him. He orders her to grab his bag and follow him to her bedroom so that he can tie her up. She hesitates but he pushes her against the wall and sticks the gun to her head. She grabs the bag and walks to her bedroom crying. He orders her to tie herself as he places the gun on the drawers. He ties the woman himself and she cries in pain at how tight the ropes are. He talks to her in his persona, Lucky, and strangles her with pantyhose, pinning her down to the bed. After a while, Don drags a chair into the room and looks at the woman hogtied on the floor. He takes out her underwear and uses it to tie a plastic bag around her head. He then takes out his camera, sits on his chair, and takes a picture. Out in the hallway, his son, Tyler, comes in with a rifle aimed at him. It turns out Tyler never went to the leadership program after all. After he receives the apology note from Cassie, he meets up with her at Nora Devlin's house. He tells her that he wants to hang out with her but this clove hitch stuff has got to stop. She invites him to come inside the house and then kisses him. He follows her into the abandoned home and they stay put in the living room. Tyler tries to kiss her again but Cassie is insistent on continuing the investigation. She tells him that the killer entered through the basement and killed Nora right there on the floor. Tyler walks out, unable to take any more of this, but Cassie tells him that she just wants to know what happened. He finally gives in and tells her what his father had told him, that Uncle Rudy is the clove hitch killer, but he tried to kill himself and then he stopped. Cassie then tells him that she actually found something when she went into their crawl space. She found rope fibers identical to the ones pointed out in the evidence. Tyler accuses her of being obsessive but she finally reveals that the reason why she's so bent on solving this, is because she believes that her mother was one of the clove hitch killer's unknown victims. Her father told her that her mother abandoned them, but she remembers being in the room when the killer murdered her mother. It was years later when she realized that her mother's death was similar to the clove hitch killer's victims, but no one would listen to her or believe her. Tyler asks her what her name was and Cassie says that it's Crystal. He then tells her that he saw a license belonging to a Crystal Harper in his father's possession. There were 13 licenses that he found and there are only 10 known victims of the killer, so Cassie's mother was definitely one of them, confirming Cassie's fears. He tells her that they already burned the evidence to save the family, but Cassie confronts him one more time, challenging him that if he has any doubt in his heart at all about his father, then he should help her solve this case once and for all. This convinces Tyler and together, they form a plan. When he leaves for his leadership program, he actually gets off the bus and heads over to Cassie's house. 
They begin piecing the pieces of the case together. Don is a handyman so this must explain why the killer can easily break into the homes. They follow Don on his jobs and even stalks him all the way to the supermarket. He sees him following the woman and even notices his lingering stare. They ride their bikes home and Tyler sneaks into the house. While Don is distracted, he goes to his parents' bedroom and installs a GPS tracker on his phone. Suddenly, his dad comes into the room and Tyler hides behind the bed. He watches in shock as he sees his father wearing women's clothing. He sends a message to Cassie to help him and she immediately comes to his rescue by ringing the doorbell. He then bails Cassie out by calling her and pretending to be her father. Back at her place, they keep their eye on the tracker and his dad's whereabouts. Cassie grows tired of waiting and they track Don back to the woman's house. Tyler insists that his dad is probably just working on a job, but she insists on going further. He continues to watch as his father appears and drives away. When he joins Cassie in the backyard, she tells him about her horrifying discovery. Cassie had seen Don tie a clove hitch knot into the pipe. Don is truly the killer and there is no doubt now. They peek into the window and confirm that the woman from the supermarket lived here. Later that night and the next day, Don's tracker didn't move. The two teenagers return to Tyler's house and find that Don had left his phone on the bed. Tyler takes out his father's rifle and they ride back to the woman's house where they find Don's car on the street. They break through the same basement window and quietly explore the house. With his rifle out, Tyler and Cassie sneak behind a counter wall as Don walks in and takes one of the dining chairs. Tyler walks to the bedroom, weapon in tow, and finally catches his dad in the act. Don reprimands him and tells him that he shouldn't be pointing a weapon unless he intends to use it. As Tyler demands his father turn himself in, he orders Cassie to free the woman. Don then tries to turn the situation around and tells him that Cassie is manipulating him. He would never hurt anyone. He tells him that he and the woman are having an affair and that they were just being kinky. Cassie calls Don a liar and runs for the gun but he grabs her and slams her across the wall. He then tells his son that he's just concerned that Cassie is unfit to handle a gun. He takes out the bullets from the revolver and coaxes Tyler to hand him the gun. Tyler, feeling completely conflicted between his father and this killer, reluctantly hands the gun to Don. Don then points the rifle at Tyler and pulls the trigger, but the gun is empty. Tyler is horrified at the realization that his own father had just tried to shoot him without second thoughts. He lunges at him, trying to pin him on the bed, but Don soon gains the upper hand. He pins his son on the floor and strangles him with one hand. Tyler struggles as he kicks and scratches at his shoulders. Suddenly, Cassie comes from behind and hits Don's head with a lamp. Don collapses on the floor and she gives him another hit to the head. As she tries to call the police, Tyler stops her and shakes his head. Weeks later, Don Burnside is still missing. Cindy, Tyler's mother, is on the verge of a mental breakdown but has managed to keep it together for her children, unaware of what her husband was doing and what her eldest had done. When they go to the community center, Pastor Randy is waiting for them and tells Cindy the grave news. They have found Don's body. Later that day, Tyler meets up with Cassie again. They agree to do nothing for they know the police will never be able to connect it with the clove hitch killer because the woman never saw his face. She reminds him that this is what he wanted to happen. When Tyler gets home, his mother slips into his bedroom and talks to him. She tells him that the police had found Don's body and wanted to talk to him, but she told them no. She then tells Tyler that the police didn't think it was an accident but rather a suicide attempt. His mother breaks down and he comforts her. After his father's funeral, Tyler is awarded as a troop leader and reads a speech in honor of his father. He looks out to the crowd, spouting lies for only he and Cassie truly knew what a horrible person Don was and what truly happened to him that night. He knows how he and Cassie dragged Don into the woods, set up the place as if he was camping, and laid out his gun as if he was cleaning it. The police and the people might believe that Don Burnside accidentally killed himself while cleaning his gun, but Tyler knows that it was his own finger that pulled the trigger. And this is a secret that he will take with him to his grave and do what his father had failed to do, protect this family. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.